I want to thank Pastor Malik for sharing his pulpit with me. That is a kindness which I feel honored for. Brothers and sisters, I don't think I have to tell you where we are in the stream of time. I think we all have a pretty clear idea that we are camped on the edge of the Jordan River. I think the priests are about to get their feet wet and they have already shouldered the Ark of the Covenant and are about to enter that stream. Now if the first waters that we passed, that were passed by the Israelites, represented baptism, the Red Sea, they also represented the early rain. And we are about to enter the waters of the Jordan, representing, of course, the nations before we cross in. And the waters are to be held back as the glory of God is to be revealed. The ark contains the character in transcript of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the question we have to ask ourselves is how are we to represent his character? Because the world must see a manifestation of the character of God such as it has not seen since the early reign. And we are privileged to be called <coughs> the representatives of God in this time that we are living in. What image are we portraying? I want to share with you some of the communications I get. I get hundreds and hundreds of letters from all over the world by people that either accept this message gladly and want to run with it, or people that have serious problems and don't know how to fit it into their mind frame because the world is so confused. The character of God lies trampled in this world by every wind of doctrine. Jesus Christ has been maligned. He has been portrayed as this strict disciplinarian judge who is out to get everyone and is ready to roast them for all eternity if they do not shape up. Then he'll make them ship out. And some of the letters I receive are so fascinating. I received one here from a Romanian fellow. He's a Baptist. And strange enough, he looked at Mordecai and the Gate, which is a lecture that I gave, which is the weirdest lecture for anyone from the outside world to get excited about. It's actually for Adventists. But he was so excited that he became a Seventh-day Adventist. And now he says he has this serious problem that he loves his Baptist friends and he's so concerned about them. And he's asking my advice. What shall he do? What shall he do? Shall he attend their church and then the other one and hop backwards and forwards and bring them the message and try and convince them he wants them all to be saved? Now that's a marvelous sentiment. If you are touched by the Spirit of God and your first concern is not yourself but everyone else and you're concerned about your family and you're concerned about your friends and you're concerned about your old church, that is a sign that the Spirit of God has really touched that heart. And then I received another one and this became a lengthy communication. I could put it out in a book form if I had to. Because the poor gentleman is so caught up in the ideologies of the world, mixed and intermingled with the ideologies of modern Christendom, that it is unthinkable that one can actually get through to a mind like this. And he watched all the stuff that we put out on, on television and the DVDs and all of this, but he's so steeped in New Age theology that he just, he just cannot get his, his fingers into it. And he says, I know that this literal interpretation of the Bible 
and of your church and the beliefs and the dogmas, dogmas must be wrong, cannot be right, cannot be right. But I'm fascinated by it, and it, under, it describes so many things that I've never understood before, but it cannot be right, it may not be right. Interesting. And I wrote to him, I'm, I'm grateful for your frank letter. And you say that everything we say is wrong at the core. But I would like to remind you, and then I remind him about the Bible and the veracity of the Bible. Because he cannot accept this word as the word of God. And I remind him of history written in advance. And I tell him about a savior. And I tell him about the character of God and this personal relationship that God wants to have with everyone. But then his neighbor pitches up and uh, says a prayer, and the neighbor is obviously a new ager. And the neighbor prays with them, and, he, and the neighbor has this beautiful prayer of love and calmness and serenity and peace and prays to a pantheistic God that is infused into nature, and you touch the nature, and you touch the trees, and you feel the energy, and you flow into all of this, and the peace that surpasses understanding covers your mind. There's no dogma, there's no Jesus, there's no evil, all is calmness and serenity in one, and it's so beautiful, how can you deny all this? So I had to think of something else to write to him. And I would say to him, and he says, why don't we just preach love? Forget about all this dogma. I said, I would love nothing more than to just preach the love of God and the unspeakable gift of his son, which he does not accept. But would I be a faithful shepherd? And then I compare Christianity to marriage. And I ask him a question, because he's constantly writing to me about his wife and what a wonderful person she is. And he feels so guilty about his own shortcomings and he doesn't know what to do with them. And at least he has his wife, he can talk to his wife. So I used that and I said to him, you know what? How would you like if your wife was a diffuse essence? just a nice fuzzy feeling in the woods and in the leaves and in the trees. Would that satisfy your soul's longing or do you want to see the face? Do you want to see the eyes? Do you want to have a personal communication? And I think it rattled him about a little bit because I said, you know, this is what God wants. God is not a diffuse essence. And he came to demonstrate it by dying on a cross. And he came to make personal contact. And yet mankind has taken this very deity who decided to die for us while we were yet sinners and to nail him to a tree because he was uncomfortable to them in terms of their thinking and their theology. I wrote to him, he says, but what about the sinful feeling that I have that I don't know how to cope with? And if I can just diffuse it into nature, it will go away and perhaps I can reincarnate or whatever. And I quoted to him Romans seven twenty five. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the, serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin because he feels so sinful. So what is the solution to this? And I told him, Jesus came to save us whilst we didn't even seek him, and while we were yet sinners. So don't feel alone in this battle against self. We're all in the same boat. You cannot change what you did. So don't dwell on it. But you can change the future with the help of God. So let the law of kindness dwell in you, and by taking the hand of Jesus, be kind to all people, and particularly to your wife. She is the wife of your youth. And she understands your struggles and your torments. How much more so will God understand them? And we carry on and on and on and it doesn't end. And he says, I feel guilty. I don't have to let it destroy me. I'm, it's just a feeling. We all have feelings and there's nothing we can do about them. 
and he finds comfort in the fact that perhaps he can talk to God personally. So some people accept the truth as it is, just like that, and have this urge, and others need coaxing and understanding, and he still battles with dogma and what it is all, all about. Take heed of the doctrine. Take heed of the doctrine, says Paul to young Timothy. Because doctrine is what distinguishes us from other people. Today we are saying, forget about dogma, forget about doctrine. The Lord will sort all that out, said Tony Palmer at one stage, when we come upstairs. Pope Francis said, if we worry about doctrine and we worry about dogma, then we'll still be fighting after the Lord comes. So forget about that. Can we forget about it? Can we forget about it? If we don't have doctrine, how do we distinguish the deity that we serve from the deity that's out there in the world? We need to know whom we serve. And the Lord has given us clear instructions as to what our duty is. And the final thing that he wrote to me was rather fascinating to me. He has a person that he respects very much. It's uh, one of his relatives, and he happens to be a Lutheran missionary. And uh, this Lutheran missionary came, and he st spoke to him about uh, the Old Testament, and he spoke to him about Adventists, and he spoke to him about the law, and the Lutheran pastor said, Oh, these Seventh-day Adventists, they always harp on the law, the law, the law. They bludgeon everyone to death with the law. And the poor man was right back where he started. And it made me think. The Ark of the Covenant containing the law of God containing the staff of Aaron and the hidden manna, is about to be carried into the Jordan. The character of God transcribed on tablets of stone is to be portrayed before the world, not in literal stones, but in living stones. And who are the living stones that are to portray the character of God? Who are they? It's you and it's me. How do we come across? Why does this Lutheran pastor think the way he thinks? Well, we all know that we can hide behind the fact that they don't understand that the law is binding, that the law hasn't been done away with. The law stands and we have to live according to the law. And if you miss one, you miss them all. Not one jot or one tittle will any, by any means disappear of the law. And if you don't shape up, then ship out. Is this the image we carry across? When we take the Ark of the Covenant across? Don't get me wrong. The law is the most beautiful analysis and portrayal of God's character that God could ever give. But it's written in a face. It's written in a person. It's not a separate entity in stone. The law is alive. The law is vibrant. The law has power. The law is written in the face of the Son of God. Do we understand what that means? When Moses wanted to see the face of God, he couldn't see it. Because had he seen it, even though he was shining from the reflected glory, covered in a cloud to hide it from him, if he saw the face of God, he would have died on the spot. So the Lord, in his kindness, hid him in the cleft of the rock and covered him there with his hand. And he passed by and he says, you can see my back. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Is that how we portray God? keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, 
by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Because sin seems to have a habit of clinging to family ties and running in family streams. Not that God wants to slaughter and hammer everyone. What is God's character really like? Well, what was Jesus like? Matthew's feast. We read about it in Luke. I want to go a little bit through Luke with you. And we look at some of these interesting, fascinating issues. Luke chapter 5, verse 29. And Levi, this is Matthew F Levi, is a tax collector. Made him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and others that sat down with them. There's always a but in the story, isn't there? As soon as people come together in the presence of Jesus, there's always a but. Their scribes and Pharisees murmured against the disciples. Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And if I ask myself, when Jesus was on this planet, how did the people react? Did they say, oh, here comes the transcript of the character of God. I'm trembling before him. That gaze, it will obliterate me. Did they? No. They ran. They ran towards him. They couldn't wait to be in his presence. Little children came running and sat on his knee. This is the character we must display. And then there were the Pharisees. What is this nonsense? Get these children away. Even his own disciples said it. Clear the path. Don't you see? This is the law. And Jesus rebuked them and said, what are you doing? What are you doing? Fasting. We carry on with Luke chapter 5, verse 33. And they said unto him, why do your disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise the disciples of the Pharisees, but thine eat and drink? The NIV changes that into a statement and not a question. I'm not going to go into the details of that. And he said to them, Can you make the children of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? I have a question for you, brothers and sisters. Is Jesus with you or is he elsewhere? Is he in your heart or is he outside knocking? If he's inside you and he's in your heart, is he not with you, yes or no? Then why do we walk around with long faces portraying a character that no one wants? Is that a good question to ask? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they shall fast in those days. Yes, we're not living in a perfect world. Yes, we have troubles and turmoils. And yes, we have to face onslaughts by the devil. And yes, we have to resist him until he flees from us. But this is not what we are to portray to the world. We are to portray the character of God. And that is in his law. The third angel's message is righteousness by faith in verity. It deals with an issue that transcends the legalities of the law. Luke chapter 5, now verse 36. And he spoke also a parable unto them, No man putteth a piece of a new garment upon an old. 
If otherwise, then both the new maketh the rent, and the peace that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. That's the King James Version. The NIV says he told them this parable. No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment, and the patch from the new one will not match the old. That's not the same story as the first one. I don't know whether you notice a subtle difference. Because in the NIV, you are patching an old garment that is obviously worn, and you are fixing it with a piece of a new garment. Now, the first part is fine, because when you take a piece out of a new garment, you obviously destroy the new garment. That's silly. Nobody's going to do that. But the King James doesn't say you're patching the old. You're just putting it on top. You're sticking it on like a sticker, like a band-aid on something that's not broken. According to the old version, he spoke, also a parable, no man putteth a piece of a new garment upon an old. Not fixing an old. Why would he put it that way? Because everybody believes that their garment is perfectly fine, thank you very much. But if you want to appear to be a Christian, Christian, well then stick a little piece of whatever suits you out of the character of God on top of it and flash it like a badge. If we look at the other translations, the German, the others, we'll see that this is clearly so. And that the new translations always change this. It gets clearer when we look at the bottles. We continue with the story because Jesus is making a point. In this whole chapter in Luke, he's making a point. And it is a coherent one. He was with the tax collectors. He was with the marginalized. He was with those who realized that they had need of a savior. But they found no access amongst the righteous ones with their perfect robes that needed no patching. Luke chapter 5, verse 37. And no man putteth, I like that word, new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. Now, this word perish, according to Thayer, means to destroy entirely, to be obliterated, to be gone, to be lost forever. Now, if you take the new translations, then things change again. Because... Luke chapter 5, verse 38 in the NIV says, no, no new wine must be poured into new wineskins. Finished. Nothing about both will be preserved. That's gone. And if we read verse 39, Jesus explains it further. And he says, no man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth new. For he says the old is better. So this word straightway, of course, means immediately. So if we put the modern word in there, it says, no man also having drunk old wine immediately desires new, for he says the old is better. If you go to the NIV, it says, and no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for they say the old is better. There's no salvation in the NIV, it's gone. Because according to the NIV, nobody wants the new wine. But according to the old translation, nobody wants it immediately. And there's a big difference. There's a big difference. Because we are so accustomed to our old garment of our own righteousness and our own works, that to give it up and to realize that I have nothing to offer, that I am totally naked and blind and bankrupt, requires a sacrifice that nobody on this planet really wants. Why do you think all the religions 
in the world are salvation by works religion. There's only one religion in the world that is salvation by faith. Now what do I want? And what are these bottles? Well, we are the bottles. We are the bottles. And we can either be new bottles or we can be old bottles. The choice is ours. Jesus could not pour the new wine into the Pharisee straight jacket because the Pharisee straight jacket could not handle the new wine. They would burst, they would be destroyed, they would be perished, they would be lost forever because they didn't want it. They'd rather burst than have it. So he had to find new bottles, those that could handle the new wine. That means they had to be stripped of their pharisaical thinking. They had to be totally cleansed from what they envisioned before. And where did he find his new bottles? Where did he find them? 17-year-old fishermen who had not been to the schools so that they hadn't been brainwashed into thinking in a certain pattern. And he could mold them and make them understand. And even with them, he had such a hard time. It was so hard for, her, for them to understand. Many have lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person his merits and his changeless love for the human family. All power to dispense the rich gifts of his character were poured out for a lost humanity. This is the message to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message to be attended by the outpouring of the Spirit. This is a message to go to the world. The world has to see a transcript of God's character. The Christian mission is to reveal the character of Christ to represent the Lord to the fallen children of men. That's our job. That's what we must do. And we must ask ourselves, what are we? Are we old bottles? Or are we new bottles? And if we are old bottles and we receive this wine, we will be destroyed. So we better change ourselves into new bottles, or else both will perish. The end is near. We have not a moment to lose. Light is shining from God's people in clear, distinct rays, bringing Jesus before the churches and before the world. The instrumentalities, listen carefully, the instrumentalities to be used are those souls who gladly receive the light of truth which God communicates to them. These are God's agencies for communicating the knowledge of the truth to the world. If through the grace of Christ his people will become new bottles, he will fill them with new wine. God will give additional light. All truths will be recovered. They will be set in right frameworks. We need to seek that truth that is hidden beneath the rubbish of error. The great message for our time is Christ our righteousness. Now if Christ is my righteousness, then how much of my own righteousness can I add? None. None. I cannot weave the righteousness of Christ into an old garment. I cannot have a patchwork character. It's either the righteousness of Christ or it's my righteousness. And I have to ask myself if Jesus sought out the publicans, not to be part of them, if he with gentle eyes forgave and cleansed the prostitute, neither do I condemn you? How much more loving and forgiving and accepting should we be? People have been bombarded with lies about the character of God. 
and the churches have been at the forefront of this activity. We are Seventh-day Adventist Christians. We have to set straight the character of God. And the way we do it is going to determine whether they will run towards you or run away from you. And this is the message for our time. When God would assure us of his immutable counsel of peace, he gives us his only begotten son to become one with the human family, forever to retain human nature. He's a human. I can speak to him face to face. I'm in a more privileged position, and so are you, than was Moses. Moses could see the back of him. The disciples and everyone since the day of disciples can look into the face of the Son of God without fear. We can look into his face. We can look into his eyes. It would have killed Moses, but it won't kill us. Because he has taken humanity to reach us. This is such a phenomenal idea that it boggles the mind. He found solace in the untutored. The Bible says not many wise, not many of great repute, not many who think that they are grand and walk around in robes of fanciness, not many of them. The character and the glory of Christ must be internalized and the law must become a transcript of his character. It is the law of kindness. Now, one story that is often misrepresented in the Bible is the story that continues in Luke. All of these things happen in succession. Jesus is explaining the character of God. He's making a point to the Pharisees which is beyond their limited idea of this box in which they have placed their religious experience. Jesus thank, thought outside the box. He destroyed the box. He obliterated the box because he had personal contact. Now this story is amazing. Luke chapter 6 verse 1, And it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first, that he went through the cornfields and his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat, rubbing them in their hand. We've always used this verse to justify our complete stand on the Sabbath. Know what the verse says? It says, it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the cornfields and his disciples plucked the ears of corns and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. And certain of the Pharisees said unto him, Why do you do which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath days? Plural. Now if you take the NIV, it obliterates it. One Sabbath, capitalized, Jesus was going through the grain fields and his disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them in their hands and eat the kernels. It doesn't say that in the King James. It says on the second Sabbath after the first, lowercase Sabbath. Some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath, capitalized, doesn't say so in the King James. It says on the Sabbath days. Well, if you want to do a little bit of checking, you go to the Geneva Commentary, because I like what the early reformers thought. They still had half a brain. And they quote, And it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the cornfields, and his disciples plucked the ears of corns and did eat, rubbing them. Christ shows, this is their commentary, against the superstitions who dwell, the superstitions who dwell on every trifle and matter, 
that the law of the very Sabbath, law letter, was not given to be kept without exception, much less that the salvation of man should consist of the outward keeping. But then they have something interesting to say. Epiphanius notes well on his tre- in his treatise where he refutes Ebion that the time when the disciples plucked the ears of corn was on the feast of unleavened bread. Now in those feasts which were kept over a period of many days as the Feast of Tabernacles and Passover, their first day and the last day were solemn. And Luke calls them fitly the last day, the second Sabbath. So what day was Jesus walking in the field? He was walking there on the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was a Sabbath. But it wasn't necessarily the Sabbath unless it was a high Sabbath. And what is the typology that is lost if we destroy this? What were they eating? What were they eating with him in the grain field? And by the way, who is the grain field? Isn't it the harvest? Isn't it the harvest that's ready? And they were walking and they were plucking unleavened bread and eating it. And Jesus takes it a step further. And he explains it to the grumbling Pharisees. And Jesus answered them and said, Have you not read so much as this, what David did, when himself was hungered, and they which were with him? And he went into the house of God, and he did take and eat the showbread, and also gave to them that were with him, which is not lawful, <coughs> which is not lawful to eat, but for the priests alone. And he said unto them that the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, lowercase in the King James. The NIV makes it uppercase. So the entire typology is lost in the new translation. So what was Jesus saying? David hungered and he went into the temple and he took the showbread and he ate it. Which is not lawful to him. Actually he should have been put to death. Nadab and Abihu suffered consequences of sacrilegious acts. Why did David get away with it? And he gave to his disciples. Why? Because he hungered. What is that hunger? Is it a literal hunger that Jesus is referring here to here? Or is it a hungering and thirsting after the righteousness of Christ? If we don't internalize the character of Jesus, if we don't hunger and thirst for a right representation of his character, then, like Nadab and Abihu, we will die. The bottles will burst. Presumption. But if we hunger and thirst for that righteousness which we can only receive by entering into the presence of God and partaking of the flesh of the Son of God, We will not make it. You studied Esther today. What did she do? She said, I will go into the presence of the king, which is not lawful, and if I perish, I perish. But if he holds out the scepter, then I will live. And so we have to enter into the presence of God with a hungering in our souls for a right representation of the character of God. One that is willing to be with the downtrodden. One that is willing to bind up the brokenhearted. One that is willing to be with the unfriendly. Have you ever tried going to the biggest grump in your church and giving him a hug instead of saying, oh, there goes grumpy again? Have you ever tried that? Watch an old grump melt if you do that. Watch it. So this was a typology, a beautiful typology, because Jesus himself was the unleavened bread, and he took his disciples 
into the field to partake of the unleavened bread, which by comparison was not lawful to the Pharisees or to the world out there in their perception, but to those who love righteousness and realize their own shortcomings. It is the essence of life. And so I went out to sow his seed. And you know the story. Some fell by the wayside, some fell by the rocks, etc., etc. Verse 10 says, And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Do you know that you have been greatly privileged to know the mysteries of God? Do you know how privileged we are to understand the relationship between law and grace, which the evangelicals battle with, falling from one theological pitfall into the next? We understand the relationship between law and grace. If we understand it, we know that we are sinners and that we are in need of grace, and that where there is no law, there is no transgression, so there must be a law. How do we portray the law? Why do people see us as they do? Have we been making mistakes? Is it time to put on the cloak of Christ's righteousness rather than our own? To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not understand. Does Jesus want to hide the fact? No, he wants everyone to know. But if he gave them the facts, they would not be able to bear it. Now the parable is this, and then he explains the parable, and you all know how it ends up. Verse 15 says, But that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it. Do you notice something? Not they that keep it. You think you are saved because you said you put one set of doctrines into your mind to replace an old set? You think that saves you? You think it saves you if you eat only vegetables? You think it saves you? No, but it's good to eat only vegetables and fruit and grains and all the other things that make you healthy, but it doesn't give you any righteousness. So let's read it again. But that on the good grounds are they which in an honest and good heart. Nobody is good, says the Bible, so this must be a righteousness over and above our own. Because only God, according to the scripture, is good. Having heard the word, keep it. Not to get points, but because they have accepted their condition. I want to be a breast beater. I want you to join me. I want to be a breast beater. I don't want to be a Pharisee. I want to stand in the temple in the back and beat my breast. And thank God that he takes note of sinners like us. No man, when he has lighted a candle, covereth it with a vessel, or puts it under a bed. But he puts it on a candlestick, that they which enter in may see the light. What kind of light are we going to be as we enter into the Jordan? As we pass through those streams held back, they want to destroy you, but they are full of souls that will be called out in the latter rain to become part of the procession that marches into Canaan. May the Lord put the law of kindness into our hearts and may he strip us of our self-righteousness that we may present him as he is to the world. Amen.